Okay, so we're, we're putting the recording up. This is, uh, we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah today. Uh, we've gone through the first three chapters of Nehemiah. So if you will find the book of Nehemiah in your Bible. <clears throat> you can probably tell it's one of my favorite uh, books. It is, it is a story that the first time I read it, it inspired me and it has continued to inspire me with this man that we now famously know and yet at some point in his life was little known. And we all need to remember that, that each each man and woman mentioned in the Bible is just as you and I are. We are just common people, aren't we? Right. We don't see ourselves as someone who, who could be a world changer or someone who could change our community or change our family or make a difference. And yet, because of the of the passion that he had for his his city, Jerusalem, and his people, the Jews, because of, of this call that he had from God, uh, Nehemiah made a difference, didn't he? Now, it doesn't come without a cost. Anytime God calls us to do something. Anytime we are called to do something, it does not come without challenges and, and battles. And we need to remember that. Because so many times, uh, men decide that they're going to do something. Somebody needs to do something and they decide to do it and then they fall away. And then they give up. And then they get, they get uh, everything's going well and they are led astray. The, uh, the finances start coming in and everything's running smooth and they're tempted and let out in the sin. And the ministry fails or the whatever they're rebuilding fails. And we need to remember that. We are always under attack by the enemy. We are always in some point where we could be led astray. And at any point in our maturity, immaturity, we can be led astray. I have heard people say that, you know, well, I'm established in God, nothing's going to move me. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a sad thing to say that. Amen. You know, I, uh, <clears throat> I always been taking these safety courses at work and safety driving courses, and I remember making the statement one day that I may have a, I may have a wreck someday, but I will never... I will never hit somebody in the rear end. Guess what happened? <laughs> I said, I said, you know, that's just that's just about the dumbest way you could have a wreck. I will never hit somebody in in the back end because that's something I can control. And lo and behold, I'd been out on uh, I went on hurricane duty down to the Gulf and and hadn't had two three hours sleep and drove eighteen hours and stayed in a hotel with no power. And, Got up at 4 o'clock in the morning and made my way down and stayed in the staging area, stand on standby waiting for a word on the radio and sitting there trying to stay awake. And, and uh, there was one car on the road besides me. There was one car. And, and so they told me where the place was I needed to go, and I found my map, and I went down the highway, they said, and there's one vehicle up ahead. I mean, it's a half a mile ahead on a four-lane highway, and I saw it. I looked up, and I'm on the radio, and I'm talking. I looked down, I looked up, and it's a little closer, and I looked down. And when I looked up the third time, I'm hitting it. I'm, and the car is stopped in the middle of a four-lane highway looking at storm damage. The people are outside seeing them the day after the hurricane came through. Well, I look at those trees over there. Well, I look at that. Look at all that water over there. And they're just stopped in the middle of the road. In my lane. Now, if I'd been in another lane, I would have just gone by. And so there, my words came back to me. I will never do that. And I did. And so if we, if we act like, you know, it, I would never give up on God. We're just, we're just like Peter, aren't we? That's right. And Nehemiah was able to overcome all those things. He was able to go through when the enemy came to him, and he trusted in God fully. So let's, let's begin in chapter 4. Now, in chapter 1 and 2, we find where Nehemiah is called. He, he hears the story that Jerusalem has been destroyed. The walls are down. The gates are taken off the hinges. There's nothing to protect Jerusalem. And the people are lying in the ruins. They're, they're living in tents. They're not in homes. It, it's like um, some of these things we see where there's a, a hurricane gone through or where there's um, a typhoon and it's destroyed a village. We see those things on our news. And this is what Jerusalem was like. And when he heard it, it broke him down to tears. And he mourned. And he cried. And then he cried out to God. And then he went before the king that he served under, the, the Persian king, and he, uh, he begged the king 
for assistance. And the king miraculously gave him assistance. And then last week, we went through chapter 3, where all the gates were uh, talked about. And I went through all those gates. And if you've not ever studied that, the gates of Nehemiah, they're in there in an order and in there in, there in a purpose because that is the walk of the, of the Christian. Every one of those gates has significance. So that brings us up to chapter 4. So Nehemiah has, has encouraged and convinced the people of Jerusalem to rebuild the city. In chapter 4, in verse 1, says, But it came to pass that when Sambai heard that we built the wall, he was wroth and took indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall break it down, break down their stone wall. The first way that the enemy will try to, to attack you is to mock you. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's done for baby Christians. The first way that he comes in, because he just he doesn't use all his armor on you to begin with. He tries to find out what kind of person you are, what you're made of. Just like if we were if we had an army attacking a country, we wouldn't go in and fire a nuclear missile, right? We would go in and, and drop what's known as a smart bomb or knock out their communications or something just to start with. So. Satan does that. He doesn't come in and throw everything that he's got in his arsenal against you. He comes in to see if he can destroy you by mocking you and embarrassing you. And that that absolutely destroys many Christians when they're immature. Mm-hmm. That's right. I mean, a simple thing like that. He comes in and he come and he starts making fun of you. Well, are you going to witness for Jesus? They're going to laugh at you, Paul. But they're going to make fun of you. You're going to say all the words right. You're not. You don't even know any, any of the Bible verses. Who do you think you are? And the first thing that'll happen is you'll shut down and you'll close the book and you'll say, I, "I'm not going to go out there with no witness anymore. I'm not going to talk to anybody about Jesus anymore." You know, and then you'll get defensive about it. If anybody asks you if you're a Christian, yeah, oh, I'm a Christian, but I don't like to talk about it. Mm-hmm. And he's one when you, when you get like that. He is one. So, if you can overcome that hurdle, that is like baby steps for Christians. Just know that if that's your battle, you've got a long way to go. He's got a lot more in his arsenal to come against you. So, that's what that's what happened to Nehemiah here is the enemy, Sanballat and Tobiah, they started mocking him. They started trying to say, you know what? You can't do it. You know what? It's impossible. What do you know about building a wall? Have you ever put gates up, Nehemiah? Have you ever built the things that you're doing are impossible to do? And so if you, it's your family and you want to restore your family and you're in order of the house and you decide that, that you're going to, your family is out of order and you're going to put your family in order, the first thing that's going to happen is somebody's going to say, man, what are you, what are you doing? Yeah. Why are you trying to be like different than the rest of us? Why don't you, do, everybody, the rest of us, we just live like the world and we're fine. Why are you trying to be different? Mm-hmm. And the first thing negative that happens to you, they'll say, see that? I told you, you shouldn't have ever done that. You should have never started taking your family to church. You should have never started reading your Bible. The devil left you alone while you was not even trying. And look what's happening now. And they'll make fun of you. Right. And they'll mock you. And you know what? You will have some times when you'll lay the stones in correctly. <clears throat> You know, you'll put them up there and they won't fit and you'll back up and, and while you're back up looking at it, they'll say, wow, that is just foolish. Look, that is just, that looks like a kid laid those stones up there. And then I had these two that just kind of, they just kind of whispered in his ear like the devil does this. Do you really think you can do this in a, I mean, do you realize how much time this is going to take? Do you know how much, this is in ruin. We, we rarely see people living in ruin. You know, when the, when the tornadoes come through, uh, we see huge, wide swaths of damage. Mm-hmm. We see the, the route that the, the wind took, and we see people digging through. 
and it's a pitiful sight. And if you've never been out, a uh, lot of places like I had to go there after a storm's come through and set up, it's it's a sad, sad place to go through because people, they're digging for anything, desperately looking for a family photo or, or some piece of clothing or something, and that's all they have left is just little scraps of their life. And these people were beyond that. They were, they were to the point where they had nothing. They were living in ruins. And Nehemiah said, that this can be changed, this can be fixed. So the first attack was something that he had a challenge to come back to. Would he give up? Would, would it embarrass him? Would he go back home to, to the, the kingdom where he was serving? Would he go back and tell the king, you know, I tried, but it didn't work out? Or would he continue on? Would he come out and challenge these men? And that's what so many people believe they're supposed to do to the devil. If you read through this, we're going to get through hopefully in this section. If you read through this, Nehemiah never goes out and challenges these people face to face. And there's a key in that that we are not supposed to go out and start challenging the devil. And I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, like you see a lot of people doing. You need to let God take care of your Bible for you. Amen. Amen. And you need to be very careful thinking that you can defeat the devil because he has had thousands of years studying mankind and studying you your whole life. Look at how it is response. He starts to pray. Verse 4. Hear, O God, our, hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity, and cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee. For they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. Now he took this he took this challenge not personally. Did you see that? He did not say, Well, they hurt my feelings. Mm-hmm. They embarrassed me. He said, God, they're challenging you. Mm-hmm. Did you see it? Amen. Have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So he started saying, God, they're challenging you. It's your problem, God. Years ago when I had a company vehicle, I began to see that if you don't have a vehicle that you're allotted to get to drive for business, you drive, drive it home or whatever, that vehicle, if you have that, you don't worry about it when the transmission goes out. Mm-hmm. You pick up the phone, pick up the radio, pick up the cell phone, and you say, uh, boss, you've got a problem, your car's broken. And how many times do we do that with our bodies? God, I'm not going to make it. I'm so sick. I've got this. The, the doctors don't even know what's wrong with me, God. You're still saying, God, you've got a problem. This body you gave me, you've got, got a problem. And then you trust God to take care of it. He said, God, you've got a problem here. These people are provoking you to anger before the builders. They're challenging you, God. It's all on you. You see that? Verse 6. So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together into the half drive, for the people had a mind to work. Amen. You've got to get everybody on the same page. That's right. You've got to get everybody on the same page. You've got to get them organized and understanding what the situation is. Now, last week, we read through where Nehemiah secretly showed up, went through the night on a horse, and one point, it was so narrow, the passage, that he could not get his horse through. He got off and went on foot. And he went around Jerusalem to see the damage in the dark. That doesn't really look like the best time to examine the damage, does it? But he didn't. He says he didn't let everyone know what he was doing. Because he had to get it in his mind how he's going to explain this. And I remember several times when things were going through, through my heart and in my mind. And I, and I thought, I need to really carefully think about this before I present this to my wife. There's some changes coming. You don't just do this at the dinner table. You know, that's, those, those are some good mashed potatoes, and by the way, we're going to start doing things a little different around here. <laughs> you know, you have to use a little tact. And I'm still learning tact, but you have to be able to communicate with people in a loving way. And so he communicated that, and here is the result of it in verse 6, for the people had a mind to work. The people came together, they said, you know what? We should see the vision that you have. Now, Nehemiah, we didn't necessarily say that he even laid one single stone, but he had got it gathered everybody together. He had did his part, 
He got all the materials together. He got the finances together. He got the organization together. And it was his responsibility when the attack came. He was over these people spiritually. He was over these people physically. He had to feed them. He had to take care of them. And when the enemy came in at night, he had to make sure that they were guarded. A great responsibility. And we sometimes forget our leaders are that way. Our leaders are supposed to be you know, taken care of also. Because they're taking care of us. They're praying for us. During the night, they're making the rounds. During the night, when everybody else is asleep, they're out there going around. And they're seeing the damage. And they're, trying, and they're praying for you. And they're praying for me. So we need to remember our leaders. This was, this was a mind to work that nobody can stop. You hear me? When someone is gathered together for one purpose, one mind and one accord, when people are gathered together, nobody can stop it. Now the devil will like you to believe that he can, but nobody can stop when people are gathered together what God's going to do. So this was, this was the one mind to work. Now, what is the response to the threat? Let's look at verse 7. But it came to pass that when Sambat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashadites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. These people now have shifted gears into a physical attack. They're no longer mocking. They're no longer just making fun. They're no longer laughing. These people now have they've heard, gotten word, and the word will always come back to you, what the devil says about you. They've gotten word back that these people have decided they're going to attack. Somebody came into the village and they said, I overheard that these people are coming in. These people do not like what we're doing. And we overheard from a caravan, or we overheard from however they heard it, that the enemy is going to come in and going to attack us in the night. And every sound they heard at night. Is it them? And when you get like that, you've now shifted gears to the physical attack. You've now got a different uh, type of attack. Verse 9, Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. And Judah said, The strength of the bears and burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so that we are not able to build a wall. And our adversaries said that they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them, and cause the work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, From all places whence ye shall return unto them, and they will be upon you. Now there is, there is a physical attack that's taking place. There's a, a possibility of physical attack. <coughs> so many times we do not prepare for the physical, or take care of the physical needs. And in studying this book as a whole, you might be surprised to find out that the physical needs taken care of first. You hear what I said? The physical needs taken care of first. Now, we get all charged up spiritually and we say, you know, we're going to change our city. We're going to have a community revival. We're going to uh, do this and this and this. We're going to go to this project. We're going to go to this part of the house. And we're going to invite people to come to church. And they're going to come to the door. And behind that door are some incredible battles going on. And we fail to see that. We open the door. We give them a track. You know, we would like to have you come to church. We would like to have you show up. We don't know that the clothes that they wear are the only clothes they have. We don't know that they haven't eaten in three days. We don't know that they haven't been able to pay their power bill. And yet we say, we want you to come to church and feel good. And we want you to, we want you to be saved. And so many times we fail to look at the physical needs of people first. Because in our mind, we have the greatest need is salvation. And we thought, well, we're going we're to get them saved first, mm -hmm. and then, then later we'll take care of the physical needs. Let me tell you something. From somebody that has been hungry and has not had any money to pay the bills, and somebody that has been under attack, if somebody comes to you with a spiritual answer, you will not hear it. If somebody comes to you and says, you know, all you need is Jesus and love, love, love. You know, that's all you need. You just need Jesus. No, I need to pay my power bill. Well, you don't even need money. You just need Jesus. I need Jesus to give me some money. 
Lord, I need, I need Jesus to help me pay my power bill. Lord, I saw that. He said, you know what, we're going to pray, but we're going to do something about it too. Okay? Look at verse 13. Therefore said I in the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. Wait a minute. You talking about God's people with some weapons? Mm -hmm. Come on. <laughs> that blows people away. Mm -hmm. You talking about God's people being armed and dangerous here? <laughs> yes. Some people would say, well, that's just, you know, that's symbolic of the sword of the Word of God. And we're just going to quote some scriptures to them when they come against us with clubs and sticks and guns and knives. We're going to just quote some scripture to them. That sounds very spiritual. That sounds very good and very religious. But in that analogy, you, know, you can take, you take the verse that says, God will provide all your needs. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't not worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, the clothes you wear. Don't worry about all that. Jesus said, just trust in me. Well, we'd be a bunch of hippies if we followed that. <laughs> right? We, I mean, the hippies had that down. Yeah. They had it down about, don't worry about what we're going to eat. We're just going to sit around. We don't have to work. I heard a man say that one time. He said, I don't have to work. Because God's going to supply my needs. Mm -hmm. That's just the same logic of using the scripture that way. But we don't have to do anything physical. We can just, we close our eyes and we can just pray. And then right after service is over, it's going to be a delicious home-cooked meal in that kitchen. Right? Mm -hmm. but nobody's going to have to worry about it. We need to focus on the spiritual here now, folks. Mm -hmm. And we need to get up and more focus on the spiritual. No, the physical needs that you have are important. That's right. The physical needs that other people have are important. And Nehemiah was a very good organizer. He set the people after their families and with their swords and their spears and their bows. Now, that is a very key thing that we look at because people need to know that they have an investment in something that's personal. They have something that they're connected with that's their own thing, their own community, their own family, their own kind, their own people, their own family. I mean, if you think about it, his connection here brought people together. His connection allowed people to see that this, this uh, investment that I'm making it's just not going to be for somebody in a third world country. It's not going to be for somebody that I'll never see or never hear back from. It's going to be a personal thing. And if you read through this entire book, you will see that the people built the gates and the part of the wall near their homes. You know? They built it near their homes. They built it in the place where that wall is going to be the one they're going to see two months from now when they're living there. It's going to be one their children and grandchildren get to see. It's going to be an investment. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't give to missionaries in other countries. I believe in that. But we need also to remember that we need to take care of our families at home. Amen. Now, here in this community, we have a group that takes care of, they train missionaries and they train people from third world countries. And for many, many years, probably 15 or 20 years over here, their whole focus was overseas. And they had people starving to death a mile down the road. They had people that, that didn't have clothes for their backs, and they're just feeding somebody over in another country. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong with that. Yeah. And I have seen pastors, their families were destroyed because they was ministering to everybody else's family, but they was ignoring their own family. Mm -hmm. I've seen men go overseas as, as quote-unquote missionaries, and they left their own families to fend for themselves. I've seen men and women that was in ministry, men in ministry and women that supported them and I've seen them go through divorce. That is not of God. It is not of God for men to be so spiritually minded that they forget their families. Mm, that's right. And I've fallen into that trap. I've been in, I've been in the church every time the doors were open. Sometimes I was the one opening the doors. I was the one that was always there. I showed up before the service started. I stayed after and folded the chairs. I showed up on Saturday to cut the grass and prepared for the day before I had been there where it took up my entire life. If I wasn't at work, I was at church. And in my mind, I was doing the right thing. And I forgot my family. 
And we have got to focus and make sure that we are, have got a vested interest in our families as a priority. <coughs> Verse 16. And it came to pass that from that time forth that half of my servants walked in the work, and the other half of them held both the spear and the shields and the bows and the habitants and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They which built it on the wall and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, and the other hand held a weapon. I don't know if you've ever laid rock or laid stone or anything, but I can't imagine having to do that with one hand on your pistol and the other hand on, on the work. Okay? So, we, we have to see the image here that we're supposed to be doing all of it. We're supposed to be taking care of all of it. We're not just supposed to be doing spiritual needs and we fold the book and okay, somebody come feed me. Somebody has to get up and go turn on the stove. Right. Somebody has to get in there and cook. Right? Mm -hmm. All this that I do and I bring forth the message, there's a little more to it than just sitting down here and, you know, lead you in it. I, I have some study I have to do in the middle of the week. And guess what? There's some other things I have to do because there's lights on here today. I had to go do a job. I had to get a paycheck. Now, it, it is some men's top dream to be in the ministry where they, in their mind, they work two days a week. You know? And, and some ministers do that. They work two days a week. And then they go play by and they go fishing. I, 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 sadly, but I've heard men do that. I've heard men that and they're going to work two days a week, Wednesday and Sunday. They get their sermons out of a uh, sermon book. Come on. You know? They're not doing any ministry outside standing in front of people and speaking. That was not Nehemiah, and that shouldn't be you. You need to have your hand on your sword and your other hand on your work. And you need to be doing both of it. You need to take care of the spiritual needs of your family and the physical needs of your family. Amen? Verse 18, For the builders, everyone had his sword girded by his side and so builded. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. Okay, so he, we here we see the plan of God to rebuild and to restore is we have to have the physical needs and the spiritual needs taken care of. Amen? Physical protection, spiritual protection, physical needs, spiritual needs, it's all done at the same time and we do not uh, neglect one or the other. Now, the next attack in chapter 5, the next attack that you see here comes from within. It comes from the nation of Israel to themselves. It's not Stand by it and to buy the bad guys. It's not the devil. But we have an internal attack here. We have an internal attack. And you can you can read into this all kind of ways. You can see into this all kind of situations. And the Holy Spirit will show you if you're the one that's attacking someone from within, or maybe it's your own flesh attacking you. You know, we often anything that's uh, tempting to us we often say it's the devil. Well, it was the demon or the devil or whatever, but our flesh yeah. is weak. Amen. You know, our flesh will attack us. Our own flesh. It's almost as if you get a kid going in a wagon down a hill and you give it a little push and then the kid goes flying down the hill. The, the person pushing is not pushing anymore. Mm -hmm. There's the kind of their momentum going. And the devil, he just comes by there and he doesn't spend a lot of time with you. He just maybe puts a thought in your head and you run with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because that's how dumb we are. We yeah. just take it. We take a temptation, and we start spending some time on. We start daydreaming about it, lusting after it, and wanting it. He's not there anymore. Yeah. Well, he doesn't have to be. You know, that's right. he's just got us going. He's got us stirred up, and he knows your flesh is weak, and he knows all. He, all it takes is you know. I was out talking about. And he said, you know, it's not a sin to see a woman without clothes on. A woman in improperly dressed. You drive down the street and a woman's improperly dressed and you look over and see her, he said, it's not a sin. He said, it's a sin when you keep circling the block. Yeah. That's right. You know? And so many times, you know, like, thinking when you're looking at that door, looking at, well, looking at that website, you know. Amen? Yeah. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I have a temptation to this. And, and uh, there was a young man one time who, who uh, would go out with his friends and he would always go to Pizza Hut 
and after the ball game, and, and they would always buy a pitcher of beer. And this young man was a Christian, and he would always be, you know, battling that. And at the end of the night, he would always break down. You know, they're all his buddies drinking a glass of beer, and he, and he wanted he didn't want to do that, but he didn't feel like he could help it. And he's, you know, at the end of the night, and he talked to the pastor, and the pastor said, he said, well, what's the situation? He said, well, every Friday night after the ball game, you know, we always go to Pizza Hut. All my buddies buy a pitcher of beer. I don't do it, but he said, you know, I feel. You know, I feel a real tempted to do that. And he said, before the night's over, I always drink a glass of beer, and then I feel bad about it. You know, I feel guilty about it, and I know I shouldn't be doing it. I know it's a terrible witness. And um, he said, I don't know what to do. And the pastor said, well, I can tell you what to do. You need to quit going to Pizza Hut. That's right. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. It's not a sin to go to Pizza Hut. And we're so dumb that we're, that's our logic. That's right. Well, show me. Wait a minute. will not you show me where it's a sin to go to Pizza Hut? Mom. Mm-hmm. That's right. I want you, sh- you know, where's that in the Bible? But why don't you show me where it's a sin? Why, why are we so dumb that we have to be shown that we can't really have the Holy Spirit to tell us mm-hmm. you shouldn't be doing that? I don't have to spell it out for you, son. Right. Amen. 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 I mean, I mean, anybody in here, parents, ever look over the glasses of them? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. we know the word, don't we? But, but we don't take our children and go, do not do that again. <laughs> Why do we want the Bible to do that for us? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's given us the Holy Spirit, and he's told us the basics of right and wrong, and when we feel guilt inside us, we ignore it. And we want the loophole. We want it, well, how, exactly how much can I do? Yeah. Exactly how many times can I go around the block? Yeah. Yeah. Amen? That's right. So this chapter 5, I've kind of gotten off track. It didn't cost you a thing for that extra. <laughs> Chapter 5. And there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against the brethren, their brethren, the Jews. For there were that said, We are sons and our daughters are many. Therefore we take up corn for them so that we may eat and live. Some also there were that said, We have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, and houses that we might buy corn because of the dearth. There were also that said, we have borrowed money for the king's tribute that upon our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our children, our children as their children. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants, and some of our daughters are brought into bondage already. Neither is it in the power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. So, in reading that, let me, let me just paraphrase. These people were under bondage by their brethren. They were under debt. They were under slavery. They were under a yoke. They were in need. And those that had took advantage of those that didn't have. Those that had money loaned it out with interest to people that were poor. Those that had food loaned it out. Or if they didn't uh, get money back, you know, well, I'll just take your firstborn. Well, your son can come work for me as a slave. And these people were their brothers. Now, you've often heard, don't do business with family. Don't, don't sell a car to your brother and expecting it to be paid back. Because sometimes people take advantage of each other. But I'm telling you, this is family. This is family. And we should not be taking advantage of one another. And this is the attack that the enemy will do. This is one of those, just get the cart going, back away. Just get it in somebody's mind that somebody owes you something. You know, we're told to loan people things or give people things without expecting in return. That's what the Word says. We've forgotten that. You know, well, I'll give money to your church, but what's in it for me? I'll give money to your ministry, but what's in it for me? And it's gotten so bad that now you hear people on the radio and they'll say, for only a suggested donation of $10, we'll send you this book. That's right. Now, the pastor's got a new book. And this book explains all about what I've just started talking about. But it's so, such a deep subject that I've got a book that's, that explains it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But for a suggested donation of $10, instead of saying, you know what, our ministry, we, we feed the hungry, we clothe people that need clothes, we have pay, get people out of bondage, and if you would like to participate in this, you can send some money. Right. 
Not a suggested donation of ten dollars, but just what you can. Yeah. And we have we've gotten sidetracked on that. Right. It is this is our family. These are our brothers and sisters. And this was the attack that Satan would use against the church. Is he would try to get us pitted one one against the other. And so many times we, we do this denominationally, we do it commun in communities, we do it in uh, competition, one church to another. We have people that go to one church and try to get members for their church. Yeah. They float through there and they're trying to build a church. If you're going to build a church, you don't steal blocks from somebody else's foundation. Do you? If I'm going to build a house, I'm not going to run into my neighbors and steal some blocks from his foundation. Take some, some uh, shingles off his roof to build my church. Right. And that's exactly what happens when you go around and you're stealing members from somebody else's church. <clears throat> Hang on, let me find my place. Uh, verse 10. I likewise and my brethren and my servants, not exactly with money and corn, I pray you, let us leave off this usury. Restore, I pray you, to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, their houses, also the hundredth part of the money, and the corn, the wine, and the oil that you exacted them. Then said they, we will restore them, and will require nothing of them. So will we do, as thou sayest. So I called the priest and took an oath of them, that they should do according to this promise. Also I shook my lap and said, So God shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performeth not this promise. Even thus be he shaken out and empty. And all the congregation said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did according to this promise. For what he made them promise to do was, Give back every man that owes to you this way. Wipe that clean. And let's move forward. And you know what? Families need to do that, don't they? They need to forgive one another, don't they? Amen. They need to move forward. You know, there's so many things of the past that we hold up. You know that you hurt them in the past. You know what? You hurt my feelings. You know what? You, you abandoned me in the past. You know what? You you said something that hurt my feelings. You know what? You and I haven't gotten along in the past, so therefore we can't speak anymore. And families need to get over that. Right. Because if families can't come together, we will never make it in the body of Christ, will we? Church members need to do that. If we have somebody that, that we've got something against, we need to take care of that. Amen. You know, and if I've offended somebody sometime, I may not even know it. It may be that somebody's, you know, they, they're over there with the spiritual okay. arms crossed and looking at me and I don't like him. I don't like his beard. You know? I don't like the way he sings. I, I don't like the way he sits in the chair when he's talking. I don't want somebody standing up. And the bottom line is there's a root to that problem that I have probably offended you or said something that hurt your feelings and may not have really tried I mean I may not say anything that I meant to hurt your feelings I may have hurt your feelings and it, the only way I'll know is if you tell me maybe maybe I was misunderstood you know, maybe I said something wrong I may have said something because I was mad at you and hurt your feelings and I apologize but unless we talk about things we can't ever get it straightened out can we? that's right the silence is sometimes the worst problem. It's the silence. So Nehemiah saw this problem and he took care of it. And he he stopped the work, you might say, to take care of this. We're going to have a staff meeting. We're going to get together. Okay, we'll ta take a little break. Put your, put your stones down, put your tools down, and let's have a little get together here. And let's talk about this. Boy, we, we get so wound up in our emotions, don't we? We get so busy with life. It's time to go to work. Time to go home. Time to cut the grass. Or I better get in the bed. You know, well, it's time for my favorite show on TV. What well, time to talk to you? I'm sorry. There's not even time left. Time to read my Bible? I wish I had time. Really? Time to sit down with my family? And fellowship, I'm sorry. Time to visit those in the hospitals. Time to take care of the widows and the orphans. I'm, I wish there was time. That clock is the same for all of us, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But we won't stop. But Nehemiah stopped his schedule 
which he was trying to take care of under the attack. And that's what the devil will do. He'll attack you from two sides. He'll threaten you that he's going to come in and he'll get you so worked up that you're trying to do all this stuff and you're watching the back for him and you're not taking care of this. Me and I stopped and took care of the problem and it was over with. I'm going to tell you it's hard to do things for the Lord when your son's in bondage. When your daughter's been sold in slavery. It's hard to do things for God when you're hungry. When you're when you're in debt and you can't get out of it, it's hard to take care of things for God. So this was this was the order that took place. Um, verses fifteen and sixteen. But the former governors that had been before me were charged chargeable into the people and had taken of them bread and wine beside forty shekels of silver. They even their servants bear rule over the people. So, but so did not I, because of the fear of the God. Yet also I continued in the work of this wall, neither brought we, bought we any land, and all my servants were gathered thither unto the work. Moreover, there were at my table a hundred and fifty of the Jews and rulers, beside those that came unto us from among the heathen that are about us. Now that which was prepared for me daily was one ox and six choice sheep, and fowls were prepared for me, and once, once in ten days stores of all sorts of wine. Yet for all this required not I the bread of the governor, because the bondage was heavy upon this people. I wish we had rulers and leaders that did not reap from the people. Amen. I wish we had leaders in our own country that would not rob from poor people. Mm -hmm. It is a sin to take advantage of people. It's a sin. Now the, now the scripture you read through there, you could read through real quick. And go, oh, that's interesting. Now stop just a minute and think about what he said. Look at all that food. When I read this, I, you know, I was speed reading the first time I read it, and I went, wait a minute. Daily was prepared for me and my one ox and six sheep. That guy had an appetite. Uh -huh. <laughs> you no, know, I read that. I thought, wait a minute. One ox and six sheep, that's a lot of meat. And then I read down that he didn't require the things that a governor would require. He actually became the governor and the leader in that respect, or the mayor, you might say, of Jerusalem. And in that, it was like, you know, really technically, this is ordinary, technically I could claim this as pay, but I'm not going to receive it. Pay. I'm not going to receive it. Pay. I'm not going to get a salary like this. We've got a governor right now in this state that has said until the uh, unemployment was settled and people, everybody had a job, that wanted a job, had a job, that he wouldn't receive a penny from the state. That's our governor right now. I wish we had no leaders like that. That they would see it as a public service and serve it for people to be in politics instead of someone who is a thief, which is what we have. So Nehemiah, had all this food brought in to feed people that he didn't extract from that and he said he didn't buy land. I'm sure there were some good land deals to be had this time when everybody was poor and he came in with some money. And he might have seen a nice little vineyard over here and he said, you know, when, it's, when all the dust settled, I'd like to live right over there. That's a beautiful little home. That could be beautiful. That would be the nice governor's mansion over there. And I, I think in all this, he did not do that. He did not take care of his own needs and look for what's in it for me. Amen? <coughs> Verse chapter 6, Now it came to pass, when Sambai and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sambai and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come let us meet together in some one of the villages of the plain of Ono, but they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto, unto, unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. One of the great weaknesses of the Christian is the repetition of the enemy. 
repetition will wear you down. If you study the scripture, you'll find that Samson was worn down by repetition. Delilah, again and again and again, asked him, what's your weakness, Samson? Tell me, what is your weakness? And he toyed with her to start with. But then eventually he wore down. Mm -hmm. You be careful about doing things when you're weak. That's right. When you're physically weak, spiritually weak, you be careful about making decisions. <laughs> and you be very cautious that the devil will bring you down in your weakness. He will continually hound you and plague you until you get in. Until you just get so tired. We as parents have to do that. We have to be careful that our children don't continue Mom, can I do this? Mom, everybody's doing this. Mom, let me do this. Mm -hmm. Mom, please, Mom, I've asked you this ten times before, Mom, but think about it one more time. Just do it one more time. Mom, just one more time, one more time, one more time. I know I'm just, I've asked you this. Mom, I know I've been talking about this for years, but I'm different now. Mom, ask me one more time. You know? And we get worn down as parents, don't we? Husbands and wives. You know, why? I'm a submissive wife. I'm a, I'm a great husband. I'm a leader as a husband. But we get worn down. Because of the other person, because of the giving in. Mm -hmm. And we have to be very cautious of that. Nehemiah had spiritual discernment, which is lacking in the church today. He had spiritual discernment to know that this man, he actually came to him and said, You need to meet me in the temple, Nehemiah, because the enemy's coming in. I want you, I got to talk to you about it. It's very secret. I need you to come in and you meet with me and we're going to talk about it mm -hmm. because I know some secrets that you don't know. And you need to come in so I can protect you. And what was going to happen was, the enemy was going to be in there and they was going to murder him. Because if you can take out the leader, you can destroy the project, right? right. right. So they was going to try to destroy the leader. And so, me and I picked up on that. We need some discernment as pastors and as leaders. We don't need to be counseling people in the office with the door shut. Men, we don't need to be ha having friendships with women at work. Hello? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, you got to pay attention. We don't need, need to be having these friendships with, with people of the opposite sex and having these one-on-one -on -one chats with them on chat rooms or on the telephone or in the break room or whatever. We, yeah. We've got to be careful about that. That's right. Yeah. Uh, we can make it in our mind where it sounds so spiritual. We have got to be very careful about that. Amen. Because the first thing the devil will do is lead you astray into the physical. Verse 15, so the wall was finished in the 20th and 5th, 20 and 5th day of the month below in 50 and 2 days. And it came to pass that when our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, and for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. Now, did you see the transition of the enemy here? The, trans the enemy started out mocking and laughing. He said, they'll never do it. And then he started laughing at them. He said, we'll never do it. And then he started coming in threatening. And they said, we're just gonna, they're going to come up and be an uprising. and they're going to be a power to be contended with, and we better go in and destroy them now. And they armed themselves. And then they tried deception. You need to come around. You need to be pulled away. You need. Well, we've got some private things we need to talk about here. And they tried to do some negotiating. Never negotiate with the enemy. That's right. Amen. Never okay. negotiate with the enemy. See, the truth is, the enemy knew how close they were to finishing. Mm -hmm. right. Sometimes he knows closer than you do. That's right. He knows how close you are to victory. Maybe before you even know it. Right. And he, he went under the greatest attack because he knows you're about to win. Amen. I see. Amen. That is that is what's going on. Are you in a real attack now? You, you're probably about to win. You're probably about to be there because in 52 days, which is not a long time, they had this wall back up. Amen. We don't know how many years this was like this. We don't know how long this wall is down. But these pot people walked around in a daze. This is just our life. Yeah. This is just the way it is. Our family's destroyed. The relationship's destroyed. You know, we're living in poverty. We've got physical needs. It's just the way it is. You know, these, these are the same people that were in bondage for 400 years as slaves. That's right. And they over outnumbered 
the Egyptians until a leader came. I mean, we need leaders, don't we? Amen. 52 days they built this back, and the enemy realized that the work was of God. Now, once you get the wall restored, what's the next step? I'm not going to go into it because we have been on this a long time this morning. But in chapter 7, you can just scan through that with your finger, and you can see almost like a census taken. Look, actually, look in chapter 7, verse 4. Now, the city was large and great, but the people were few therein, and the houses were not built. In verse 66, the whole congregation together was 40 and 2,300 and 44. So there's 42,360 people in this city. That's a pretty good sized town. Our little town up the road here is 4,000 population. We live in a small community. 42,000 is a fair sized city, isn't it? So this is a city of 42,000. What took them so long to build this wall? They just needed to be organized, didn't they? That's all they needed. Need some materials coming in, and let's get the job done. Now the, the walls are built back. Organization of the city needs to take place, and now the spiritual things can take place. So at this point, the spiritual things begin to take place. Come through a few more chapters. Verse chapter eight. They read the law. All the people stood while Ezra the priest stood up and read from morning to midday. The men stood there while the word of God was read. Well, I, I get tired. I wish the pastor would just be... <laughs> you know what? The, the restaurants, if we don't read, the restaurants are going to get pretty full. So I know the pastor's not through yet, so I, I think we better leave. We won't get good parking at the restaurant if we... If you know. These men stood from the morning until midday desperate to hear the word of God. Hungry. You know what? They probably, many of them were hungry. They probably were not at this point well off where they ate well, but they saw a great spiritual need. They had seen the hand of God at work. They had seen the wall go back up, a miracle before their eyes. And all of a sudden they said, you know what? We realize there's more need here. We realize there's a great spiritual need here. It's more than just getting your body healed, getting your bills paid. You need the spiritual healing too. These people stood there all that time. They began to read the law. And they began to realize, we haven't been doing this. We haven't followed this. I remember the, the day that came to my life when I found the Lord. I didn't do anything spiritually with my family. I took them to church. I was there with them. Felt real good about it. Patted myself on the back, you know. I took I took I take my family to church. What's it for you? What else are you doing? And then in the day that it occurred to me, you need to be having some devotions with your family. You need to be doing Bible study with your family. And that's how we've got to be home church in here, is we started doing that. You need to be worshiping with your family. Do you ever sing with your family? I came home from my friend's house one day. I was at uh, I was at their, their house and got in a car with him. His mom driving. We went in a big old giant station wagon to the store. I'm in the back seat with my buddy, and she starts singing. And the whole bunch of all his, my buddy and all his sisters and brothers started singing. Now at that time I was a Christian. What is this? I don't understand this singing in the car, and it's not even Sunday. <laughs> they're singing the hymn, and I understand they're singing in the car. You know, that woman, I bet she didn't think twice about it, but she doesn't realize that that's stuck in my mind the rest of my life. You know, we need to take care of the spiritual things. Ezra read the scripture. There was, uh, the law was set back up. The uh, regular seven-day, every seven-day worship was, was uh, established. And the people realized they were in sin. No. Now we want to put that up front. You know, we want to open the door, no. knock on the door, open the door, and say, "Do you realize you're going to hell? No, but Did you realize that you that you need Jesus in your life? 
All they know is their stomach hurts because they're hungry. And all they know is they're worried about how they're going to pay their bills. But you need Jesus. Don't worry about all that. You need Jesus. We worry about it, don't we? We take care of our physical needs. We should. Now this this entire book of Nehemiah is this way. This is probably the last time I'll speak of it. But the order was set back up in the city of Jerusalem. In the worship, in the laws and reading of the word, in the temple was we'll set back up. All of this was established again. And I have to tell you that historically Nehemiah went away and when he came back, I think it was twelve years later, they had stopped doing it. That's sad, isn't it? But it tells me something. When leaders are leading, they don't need to back away and let it all, you know, just momentum just take place. We have got to continue on as leaders. We've got to continue on in whatever we've begun. We've got to finish. We've got to take it out. Uh, If we've got children and we've raised our children, we we just, wow, that was this great. You know, I'm through homeschooling my kids. I'm just so glad we're through with that. And we've got grandkids coming up. Mm-hmm. And we have a responsibility to them. Mm-hmm. Right? And Lord willing, I'll have great grandkids one day. Mm-hmm. And we'll have a responsibility mm-hmm. to them. Mm-hmm. And we do not give up. As long as there's breath in us, we do not give up. Because if we back away, if there's not leadership there, if we back away, things will stop taking place. Now, I know that's the dream of every mother and father, but, you know, we just, we you go that direction, and then now you're on your own. But you're supposed to still be mom and dad, even after they're adults, even after you you, know, you have grandkids. Amen? Amen. Now, what is what is the story? I'm going to finish that. What is the story behind Nehemiah? Nehemiah saw the need. And there's so many needs today in families, in churches, in communities. I mean, needs everywhere. Everything is out of order. People have, people have just thrown everything out that was established in this country and in families. Families are falling apart. The family structure is being torn apart. People are telling telling us in society that you can just, you know, two men can be a family. You know, a woman and a dog can be a family. I mean, you know, they, they have taken apart what God has said. What we need to do is go back to the Bible and see what God has said. Yeah. What does he say is right? That is what we need to follow. Mm-hmm. And then we need to follow it. Amen. Amen. We need to establish those things again. Let's let's pray. Father, we come before you today asking, Lord, that you would establish us once again. Lord, at one time this nation was a great nation under God. It was a nation that men and women prayed with children, that men and women were led in schools, in public schools even. They led children to Christ. They prayed, Father, over their meals. And Father, that has all been thrown out. And this secular society is overrunning and taking over us. And it has even uh, leaped over into the church, Father. The churches have decided that they needed to be more like the world. And in doing so, Father, we have just blown out the candle that is the light for the world that has been set on the candlestick. We have just thrown out the light, Father. And I pray that that would be established once again, that men and women of God would see the need, that they would see the void, Father, that is there. They would mourn over it and they would get it in their hearts to do something different. And that once they make their minds up to do it different and that you enable them to do it, Father, that they would not let the enemy come in to them and that the wall would be rebuilt, that the gates would be put up, that order would be established in the city once again. And Lord, it's spiritually that you would restore us once again in our families, in our churches, in our communities, and in our countries. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. With the prayer we're saying. We need to pray over Sam. Okay, so we're going to stop this for a